Good morning and welcome to worship this morning on the day the Lord has provided for us. I welcome all visitors on behalf of the congregation. Please join us for morning tea following the service in the church hall. Thank you. Shout for the joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us worship our triune God with humble yet joyful heart. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning. We thank you for all the blessings, all your goodness, all things that you give us. Thank you for your faithfulness that never ends. 
We thank you that this morning you bring us here to worship you. The privilege that is not given to many out there. Heavenly Father, we praise your name that you are not only our God, but also our Father. In Jesus, you only begotten Son, you adopted us into your own family. We acknowledge, Father, that many times in our lives, also in the passing week, we are not always be thankful to you. In the words that we say, in the thought that we think, and in all our deeds, in many of our deeds, we were not demonstrating our gratitude to you. Forgive us, Father, and strengthen us so that while we are going to enjoy your presence and foretaste your kingdom during this worship hour, and even as we leave this building later, we are strengthened and empowered in our faith to you, to be thankful to you for everything that we receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For all of us who have confessed our sins before God, let us, let me read for you from the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 24. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Humbly and gladly, I can let you know that only in our Savior, Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So today we come to an end of the week of Holiday Club 2024. This year's theme was more than gold and was based around the Olympics. As together we looked at what it means to be part of the greatest team, Team Jesus. We praise God for the week that we had and wanted to share a few highlights with you today. So Holiday Club is always one of our favorite weeks of the year as we see God at work in answering prayers, sowing seeds for the kingdom by speaking into children's hearts and encouraging and building relationships amongst those in our volunteer team. We praise God for this special week of outreach ministry and the way he is at work. At Holiday Club, we began each morning with craft activities, games, morning tea, songs, a drama, story time with our own grandma story time thanks to Sheila 
small group time, Olympic country challenges in our team countries, and a memory verse for each day. We learn at Holiday Club that Jesus loves us all more than gold, and he welcomes all of us to be a part of his team. We heard from a family that the children were so keen to learn the memory verse during breakfast, they were trying to get their mum to help them learn it. Instead, she gave them a Bible and the siblings practiced together instead. How amazing that because of Holiday Club, we had kids who are super keen to read the Bible each morning. We wonder if anyone can still remember the memory verses. Why not ask someone after church if, if they can tell you one of them? So throughout the week, we journeyed through the book of Luke to discover more about the nature and love of Jesus. On Tuesday, we focused on the parable of the wise and foolish builders and how we are to dig our foundation deep in Jesus so we can stand tall during the storms of life. Jesus shows us he is our trainer and invites us to follow and obey his instructions. On Wednesday, we learnt that Jesus is our physio, the one who can heal people, even at a distance. Jesus was able to heal the centurion's servant by the faith of the centurion. We can have faith and trust in Jesus too, even when we can't see where he's leading us. On Thursday, we discovered that Jesus, Jesus had lots of people on his team and each one had a part to play. Even a small boy with just some fish and bread played an important part in God's story. This is the same today. Jesus is our teammate and everyone who follows Jesus has a special job to do for him. He welcomes everyone to be part of his team. On Friday, we learn about Jesus being the game changer as he substituted for our wrongs and defeated death by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, being alive forever. This was the first time some of the kids would have heard the gospel message and had it explained to them. A huge credit to our team, who together were able to welcome 80 kids across the week, 18 of them from our own church here at St Andrews. 44 from other churches across Canberra, and 18 who have no church connection. We've heard amazing feedback from families, telling us their kids had a great time, lots of fun, and they've learnt more about Jesus. One child had such a great day on their first day that when they were picked up, they requested to sign up for the next day. And their mother was actually quite surprised, as this child is always really hesitant in attending new programs and we had other children register for more, day, more days during the week than they'd originally first planned. One family shared that their son was a little nervous to attend his second day, and when asked why, it was because day one had been so much fun, he was worried that day two wouldn't be as good. But we found out on Friday, each day surpassed his expectations and he had the best week and couldn't wait for the family fun night to begin. A number of families told us that they were so thankful for all our volunteers that they felt welcomed and safe as they walked through the doors each morning. Many families have already told us they can't wait to sign up for next year with a few excited younger siblings eager to be involved as well. Lots of families wish we could have Holiday Club every holidays because kids love it so much. But none of this would be possible if it weren't for our team of nine youth leaders and 27 adults who are willing to give their time to serve families during the week. We are ever so grateful for this team of energy bunnies who continue to show up each morning, keen to share God's love with everyone who walks through the door which the families really noticed. So we know that some of our leaders have gone on holidays or are very tired from the busy week, but if there are any here this morning, we'd like to ask them to stand so we can show our appreciation to you.
if they're brave. Hmm? <laughs> I think there's a few hiding, but that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, these beautiful people are definitely an answer to prayer. So without each of them, the week would not have been possible. On Friday night, we hosted our family fun night, where the hall was truly buzzing. We praise God that we were able to spend the evening with over 100 people, including parents, children, and members of our church, gathered inside for our closing ceremony. The evening began with some family activities and challenges, a time of worship in which we shared the stories and songs from Holiday Club, plus a presentation of the gospel through the wordless book. We finished the evening with dinner and of course dessert. It was amazing to see the hall full of so many families and a wonderful opportunity for our church community to hear such positive comments and to continue to build connections with these families. So we'd like to thank everyone who supported this year's Holiday Club in any way, and especially for your prayers and God who answered them. We praise God for the seeds that we were able to plant and we ask that you continue to pray for the conversations that the children and families may continue to have together. So may they come to know God as their Lord, friend and saviour from what they've learnt about Jesus during this year's Holiday Club. We'd now like to share just a few highlights from our week through photos that you can see on the screen. Come on, you champions, join the winning side. Come on, you champions, cross the finish line. With Jesus, our trainer and teammate, he is alive and so we celebrate. Two, three, four. Come on, you champions, join the winning side. Come on, you champions, cross the finish line. With Jesus, our trainer and teammate, he is alive and so they celebrate. Get on your marks, off you go. Join the race to reach the goal. Work as a team, listen and obey. Cause everyone has a part to play. Get on your marks, off you go. Join the race to reach the goal. Work as a team. Because champion is alive today. Come on, you champions, join the winning side. Come on, you champions, cross the finish line. With Jesus, our trainer and teammate, he is alive. And so we celebrate. Two, three, four. Come on, you champions, join the winning side. Come on, you champions, cross the finish line. With Jesus, our trainer and teammate, he is alive today. And so let's celebrate.
One thing Beck and Braun did not do was thank themselves. Obviously, they couldn't. So on your behalf, behalf of all of the parents and kids who came during the week and all of the congregation, because they were representing you as well, uh, can I just say that I admire what um, th these folk do. It's absolutely incredible the amount of hours they spend in preparation for weeks and weeks beforehand, and I stand in admiration to see the level of commitment and dedication they show uh, through the week. Uh, so please um, join with me in expressing your appreciation to Back and Braun for all that they did to make Holiday Club this year such an outstanding success. I draw to your attention the sale of the anniversary dinner tickets. They will be on sale in the hall again this morning. The committee has met this week and certainly we are now at the pointy end of the planning for the weekend of the anniversary. So I encourage you all to think about coming to the anniversary dinner, which will be a very exciting event for this church. I can say no more except thank you again to the Holiday Club and the leaders and all that goes on behind the scenes and it has been just an, a tremendous outreach for this congregation and this church and a great promotion so sincerely thank you. Chinese whispers work well in this church and this morning it has been brought to my attention that today is Campbell Egan's birthday. And Campbell has been our honorary minister for some time, but stepped down 
last year. And so on behalf of the congregation, I wish Campbell a very, very happy birthday today. So happy birthday, Campbell. I might be in trouble now. I am his elder, so I look forward to my next visit. And I think that might be all the intimations I have. Thank you. Yes. Yep, Jenny. Sorry. Good morning, friends, family, and church family, and people who have walked off the street. Lovely to see you this morning. Um, my name's Jenny. I am the convener of the Mission Action Group at St. Andrews. I just want to draw your attention to the bulletin. We've got an event next Saturday, which is the 20th, 20th thank you, of, um, of July, and it's 2 p.m. here in the hall we're going to have a very special performer. Um, his name is Daniel Thornton. He's come all the way from Sydney um, with his family and he's going to be singing a few um, Christmas in July songs. So the Christian Christmas in July songs. Um, he'll be playing the guitar and um, it'll be a very, very joyful event. Um, entry is by donation. It is a family-friendly event, so you can bring your fa family who are not Christians, um, invite your work colleagues. I'm sure everyone will know the songs on the list. Um, they're just your, you know, Christmas in July, Christmas songs. I do have a list um, with me, but if you want to know what they are, you have to come on the day, okay? So that's, that's my kicker. Um, I also want to just share some information about Daniel um, because I was advised there are a few Daniel Thorntons on the internet, okay? So this is the Daniel Thornton that will be coming to perform. So he's a lecturer at the Alpha Crew University College in Sydney. Um, he's the head of the School of Pathways, Arts and Businesses and a member of the academic board. His postgraduate studies were in music and theology and his research outputs include the 2021 book Meaning Making in the Contemporary Congressional Song Genre. He has recorded and produced over 15 albums of original songs and his works have been performed by the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and other prestigious assemblies. Daniel is also an ordained minister with the Australian Christian Churches and has served as worship pastor slash associate pastor at several churches. Okay, and this includes Future Churches, Life Source Christian Church, Iron Church, C3 Mountain Anan. He has recorded and produced worship albums, including Christmas Presents for Worshippers, for, from Worshippers, Daniel Piano Worship Classes 2, It Is Well Instrumentals, Worship Classics, One Heart, Worship Always, Paradise, It Is Well, Volume 2, It Is Well, Volume 1, amongst others. Daniel has also performed a starring role in the off-Broadway premiere of Angels at the Duke Theatre in New York, as well as starring roles in Gospel, Hero, Prodigal, and other musical theatre productions. So Daniel is a member of the Pentecostal Studies and Pastoral Theology and Ministry Research Clusters. So he's, um, he can also sing as well, and he's <laughs> amongst all those talents, um, and he has kindly volunteered his time to come and spend with us um, to help us raise money for our missionaries. So please all welcome, and I challenge everybody here to invite three people outside of the congregation today to come to Saturday's event. It's two o'clock, and there will be afternoon tea following the event. Thank you. Course. The and concert the is in the church. Tea's in the hall. Yep, and right. afternoon teas in the hall. So um, please come to both if you can. Thank you. Well,
morning, church family. This morning's uh, uh, Bible reading, first uh, Bible reading comes from Psalm 24, verses 1 to 10. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of the Lord of Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah, the word of the Lord. Good morning, church family. Today's second Bible reading is coming from Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Titus 1, sorry, Titus 2, 1 to 10. But as for you, teach what accords with the sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, 
self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. All the women likewise are to be reverent in uh, behaviors, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Born servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentatives, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the first couple of centuries of Christianity, the lives of the Christians were an incredibly strong testimony to the transforming power of Christ in their lives. There are letters from Roman officials that contain information about how Christians did an amazing job caring, taking care of their own people's needs as well as the needs within the communities in which they lived. The letters refer to how these Christians could not be coerced into denying Jesus, even if it cost them their lives. However, as time passed by, the powerful witness of many Christians began to diminish. The 19th century German philosopher Henrik Hein said to Christians, Show me your redeemed life, and I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. Mahatma Gandhi is quoted as saying to Christians, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Many people who aren't Christians or who have no Christian faith are good judges of the standard of life Christians should live by. They aren't very impressed. There often appears to be a disconnect between what Christians believe and the way they live. The sad reality is that Paul's statement in Titus chapter 1, verse 16a, describes the lives of many Christians. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. The irony is that Paul's comment was actually addressed to false teachers who had crept into the churches on the island of Crete. Paul describes them in verse 16b, they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. 
The Greek word adokemos, translated unfit, or in some translations, useless, is a most interesting word. It is used of a stone which the builders rejected. If a stone had a flaw in it, it was marked with a capital A and put aside as being unfit to have any place in the construction of a building. The ultimate test of a Christian's life is fitness or usefulness. Are we Christians fit for purpose? Are we of use to God and to people? Are we helping God's work in the world, or are we hindering it? In Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, Paul turns from the activities of the false teachers to Titus's responsibility as a true teacher. The opening words of verse 1, but as for you, and for those of you who may be following in the NIV translation, you will notice that this phrase is missing. It should be there. It's there in the ESV that we had read. But as for you, that's a reference to Titus. This phrase emphasizes Titus's distinctive role in contrast to that of the false teachers. Paul is calling Titus to be different, to stand out from the prevailing culture all around him. Paul urges Titus to behave in a way that is entirely unlike that of the false teachers. There was to be no dichotomy in his teaching between belief and behavior. After the opening phrase, but as for you, Paul continues, teach what accords with sound doctrine. This compressed phrase indicates that two strands are to be interwoven in Titus's teaching. On the one hand, there is the emphasis on the, the sound doctrine. The definite article implies an identifiable body of teaching. On the other hand, there are the things which fit it or accord with it, namely the ethical duties which the sound doctrine demands. The Greek word that's translated sound is the present participle of the verb hygiano, which means to be healthy. The cognate adjective hyges, from which we get our English word hygiene, also means healthy or fit. It is often used in the four Gospels of people who, having been healed of some physical defect or disability, are now whole, healed, with all their organs and faculties functioning normally. In Paul's pastoral letters, the adjective is applied several times to Christian doctrine, which is healthy or wholesome, in contrast to the unhealthy, sick teaching of the false teachers. Further, Christian doctrine is healthy in the same way as the human body is healthy. John Stott has a very insightful comment here when he writes, Christian doctrine resembles 
the human body. It is a coordinated system consisting of different parts which relate to one another and together constitute a harmonious whole. If therefore our theology is maimed with bits missing, or diseased with bits distorted, it is not sound or healthy. We are often told that doctrine, what you believe, statement of belief, doesn't really matter. As long as you have a sincere faith, that's what's important. But Paul is making it absolutely clear here to Titus that doctrine does matter. It is essential that we subscribe to the teaching of Scripture around the central truths of the gospel. What is your doctrine like? Are you a healthy Christian, or have you a disease? By that I mean, is there some heretical understanding in your belief? You see, we cannot really continue until we get the doctrinal part absolutely right. And I wonder, are some of us unhealthy Christians because our doctrine is defective? In addition to the sound doctrine, Paul charges Titus to teach the things which fit it or are in accord with it. This centers around the practical duties which arise out of sound doctrine. There is an indissoluble connection between Christian doctrine and Christian duty, between theology and ethics. Paul isn't content to deal with abstract ideas or generalities. Instead, he charges Titus to apply sound doctrine to five categories of people in the Cretan churches according to age, sex, and occupation. We have this from verses 2 to 6 and then from verses 9 to 10. I can't go into these in great detail today simply because of time. Uh, some of these areas are really sermons in themselves, so I'm going to be very general in my comments. Paul gives specific advice for each category of people. Let's summarize very quickly. Older men are to be serious, sensible, and sound, not merely in doctrine, but in faith, love, and steadfastness. Older women are also to be reverent, to be good teachers of younger women, and generally to set a good example. Both younger men and younger women must watch their behavior so as not to cause any discredit to the Christian community. The advice to slaves is to be seen in the context of life as it was in the first century. Now, as we know, slavery was a fact of life in that era. I want to make it clear that Paul in no way here is condoning slavery. Thankfully, due to William Wilberforce, slavery is long gone. However, we can take the principles of what Paul is talking about here in the context of slaves and apply it to the relationship between employers and employees. 
If you look closely at the five categories, you will observe that Paul is highlighting the ordered integrity of family life. He focuses on Christian relationships in the home. One of the trends I have noticed in society over the course of my ministry is the breakdown of family life. The nuclear family unit, which consists of two parents, a father and a mother, living with their children at home is under attack these days. Let me read to you something that N.T. Wright, the former Bishop of Durham, wrote concerning this. Today, of course, people sneer at family life. Many in fashionable Western society regard it as dispensable, a hangover from an older day when people were cowed and submissive, when a bullying father ruled the household with a rod of iron. We're free, people say. We don't have to live like that anymore. To insist on household rules for women, children, and slaves is to turn the clock back. If someone really ran their household the way Paul seems to be urging, some neighbors might report them to the police. Now, that was an observation made by a former Anglican bishop in the United Kingdom. The reality, folk, is that family life has in so many areas broken down. The problem is that when the family unit breaks down, society breaks down. And when we look at our broken society these days, even in Australia, the reason I believe why we are in the mess we are in terms of our society's problems is because we have allowed the family unit to break down. I know that kind of talk is very unfashionable these days. It's not woke, but it is what the Bible clearly says. And if only we would go back to what Paul is doing here and applying these principles to family life, I believe we would have a changed and better society. There is one unusual point to note in the middle of Paul's list. He seems to break off, that's Paul, he seems to break off, and he now has specific advice to Titus himself. And we have this in verses 7 and 8. At the beginning of verse 7, he says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. There is a natural tendency for individuals to imitate others. You see this in children. They imitate those who are older. They want to be like them, do what they do. It's probably true to say that we all need models, people that we can follow their example. They give us direction and inspiration. Paul expected Titus to provide a model which the churches could follow. Here was this young man working in these churches on the island of Crete, and Paul is saying to him, your life, not just your doctrine, not just what you're saying, 
But the way you are going to live should be a model for these people in your congregations to follow. The word that's used here is typos. That's the Greek word, which simply means a prototype or pattern. It literally means an impress of a die, and hence, in a metaphorical sense, an example. The exhortations of Titus would carry no weight unless they were backed by the pattern of his life. The spotlight next is transferred to Titus's teaching. In verses 7b and 8a, it was to have three characteristics. The Greek word apithuria, translated integrity, literally means uncorruptness. It possibly alludes to Titus's motives in ministry. Seriousness clearly refers to Titus's manner in teaching. Soundness of speech means that the matter of Titus's instruction must be wholesome and true. Now, th this raises some very interesting points, and there may be some disagreement uh, amongst uh, people regarding these. Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, for example, who was the minister of Westminster Chapel in London, he made it very clear that he was not a man of humor in the pulpit. He was always very serious because he felt that he was handling the precious Word of God. So, telling jokes from the pulpit was not really his style. And some people thought he was too serious. But he believed that as he was standing in the presence of a holy God declaring the Word of God to his congregation, that he needed to be very serious. Well, it's an interesting kind of debate because she's not here today, so I can say this. My better half thinks that I'm too serious in the pulpit. And too serious up here when I'm leading worship as well. So, I usually get a weekly lecture when I go home. And I've been listening to it for 40 years, so it's probably not going to like it to change. There's probably a balance to be struck here. But Paul is saying to Titus, you have got to be serious as you declare the doctrine of Scripture. And in everything that we say as preachers, it should be wholesome and true. There should be nothing, there should be nothing lightweight about it. It should be based solely on God's precious Word. Well, Paul is telling Titus to instruct the members of the churches on the island of Crete to live their lives in such a way that the sound doctrine would have a practical side to it. In terms of it being lived out, it will be attractive to other people, and it will draw them to the gospel. It will attract them to Christ. The main point that Paul was getting across to Titus here was that a Christian's behavior displays the truth and the relevance of the gospel. There shouldn't be an incongruity, but rather a beautiful reflection of Jesus Christ. So, what's the main lesson then from our third study in the book of Titus? The lesson we learn from today's passage is that while it is essential to have the right doctrine, 
that in itself is not enough. Sound doctrine has to be lived out in a practical way. What we learn from a sermon on Sunday in a Bible study group during the week or in daily private Bible study must be lived out practically in our lives every day. The goal of a sermon is not merely intellectual knowledge. If all that happens when you leave church at the end of the service and you say, well, that was a, a most interesting sermon, my mind was really stimulated by it, if that's all there is to it, then we've missed the point. The goal of a sermon is to produce in each one of you and in myself a transformed life. It's great to have sound doctrine. Indeed, it's essential. But it has to be then lived out in practical ways. And the people out in the community, the people you live amongst, the people you work amongst, if they don't see any difference on Monday morning in your life, then the sermon has been a waste of time. Our behavior, how we relate to other people, how we work in with other people in an employment situation or whatever it may be, even in the life of the church as well, our behavior should always tally with our belief. So let me ask you then as we conclude, are we healthy and fit Christians? I trust that we will strive to go from this service today desiring to live healthy Christian lives. Amen.
God with the church from all ages and all places by saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us again today to bring our offering to you. We acknowledge, Father, that all we have is from you, and we bring our offering today as our acknowledgement that we depend on you in everything. Father, receive our offering and use them by the hands and minds that you have anointed for the sake of the mission of your kingdom in this church and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray for all of the children who attended Holy Club this year, and we hope that the lessons that they were taught help them to create or develop a stronger relationship with you. We pray for all of the parents and carers who brought their children to Holy Club this year, and we pray that they, they help their children in continuing to build a stronger faith in you, Lord. We pray that you bless all of the volunteers who assisted during Holy Club this year for teaching and praising your name and your son's name. We pray that you bless the coordinators Beck and Braun for planning and setting up Holiday Club this year, and we ask that you grant them more successful years to come with more children attending to strengthen or grow a stronger faith with you. We commit to you Gareth and Helen Rowe, representing Gideons in Phoenix, Arizona, USA, at the Gideons International Convention. Lord, grant them safe travel. We commit Helen to you as she leads three breakout sessions, speaking to around a thousand women. Lord, Grant her a clear mind and help her to feel your presence if she is feeling nervous. Lord, as she speaks about mentoring and membership issues within Gideon's, we ask that many ladies will be inspired and encouraged. We pray for all of the world leaders at the NADA, pardon me, we pray for all of the world leaders as the NADA summer has just concluded, and we pray that the major decisions made will have a positive effect globally. We pray for the war in Ukraine and Gaza as it has caused people grief, pain, and despair and we pray for ceasefire or resolution as people are shedding blood for such a ruthless and merciless battle. We pray for all the people who lost their lives or lost the life of a beloved during this war, and we pray that you grant them peace and resolve. We pray this all in your name with the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.